Mr. Speaker. Ibrahim Omar. Mr. Speaker, I second the motion that the respectful address be presented to Her Excellency Governor General in a reply to Her Excellency's speech. Engamana, Engario, Engaiwi, Engaro Tangatirama, Tena Koto, Tena Koto, Tena Tato Kato. Mr. Speaker, I want to acknowledge and congratulate you on your re-election, on your role. I also want to acknowledge the other presiding officers who have been elected today. I look forward to your guidance and your wise wisdom. Kia ora and assalamu alaikum. My name is Ibrahim Omar. I'm an Eritrean. I'm a son, brother, a friend. I'm a Muslim. I'm a former refugee, I'm a trade unionist and living wage activist. But most importantly, I stand here today in front of you, bursting with pride as a Kiwi who loves Aotearoa New Zealand. My, my journey to this place has been the long one. The story of my journey is the story of every refugee, displaced and forced from, the, from their home country and their loved ones. My vision is for my, for my journey to give hope to the many other people with stories like mine. Mine was, my vision was, my journey began 15,000 kilometers away in a beautiful small East African country called Eritrea. My forebears were chiefs, warriors who led their people to free to defend their land from invaders who handed down their values of social justice and defending human rights to me and to my family. My grandfathers were leaders in their villages and their clans. Our family slowly moved to move to the city and my father went to the school and learned many languages. My mother was a loving mom to me and my four brothers and my sister. Mine was a happy and typical Eritrean upbringing. I grew up in a tolerant society where people from different cultures and religious backgrounds embraced each other. My extended family were Muslims, but our neighbors were Christians, and we shared our lives together. We celebrated Christian holidays with them, and they celebrated the Muslim holidays with us. I attended public schools, including Islamic primary school, and then my local junior and high school. It was a loving and tolerant environment, culturally conservative, but with a strong sense of social justice and standing up for people who didn't have enough. As a child, I was full of hopes and ambitions and dreams. Among the very long list of things I wanted to be and do, two things stood out for me. To be a football player, <laughs> like Ronaldo from Brazil, or a politician. But those dreams were cut short by a brutal dictatorship that killed dreams of thousands of young Eritrean men and women. Mr. Speaker, my home country, I saw politi how politics and politicians ruined people's lives. And hence, I gave up my dream to be a politician. My homeland has a long history of invasion and colonization by first Italians, the British, and then Ethiopians. The impacts of colonization are still being experienced as I speak here today. Right now, Mr. Speaker, tens of thousands of innocent Ethiopians are being displaced by this unnecessary and senseless war in Ethiopia. In the last two weeks alone, 40,000 Ethiopians have, been, have become refugees and fleeing to Sudan for safety. In addition to this, about 100,000 Eritrean refugees who have been living in the areas of conflict are now in danger. Mr. Speaker, nearly all my life in Eritrea, there was a war. For 30 years, my country was locked in a war for independence. I remember the terror when the war raged in our city. I was young, but I vividly remember the fighting. There was no 
power. We had very little food. The city was surrounded by the fighters for months and months. Then independence was declared in Eritrea. I saw music and dancing people on the streets all the time for about day and night for about a month. We believed that Eritrea could be the shining star for Africa, where else, everywhere else there was where were coups and civil wars. But our country was betrayed by the same people who fought for Eritrea, who fought to free Eritrea from colonizers. They took away our dreams. And now, Mr. Speaker, Eritrea is one of the biggest refugee producing countries per capita in the world. I was drafted to the National Service at a very young age, as a high school student. I was subject to extreme hardships. The National Service in Eritrea is meant to be for 18 months, but in reality, it's indefinite. Once you are in, there is no way out of it. Eritrea was and still is a place where citizens disappear for no reason. Mr. Speaker, gross human rights abuses, arbitrary arrests, and imprisonment are normal. I knew I had no choice but to leave before my time came. So, Mr. Speaker, I left behind everything I loved. My country, my family, my friends, and my dreams, including the, lost list, list, the long list of things I wanted to be and do. The chance of making it to Sudan was probably about 50-50. Lots of people don't make it. At the time, there was a shoot to kill policy for deserters. I took the risk. I said to myself, I would rather die trying to escape than to die slow days in Eritrea. Weeks later, I made it. I came, I made it, I crossed the border and handed myself into the UNHCR camp and the Sudanese authorities, and I was granted refugee status to stay in Sudan. Five years later, I came to New Zealand as a refugee. I had never heard of this place, to be honest. <laughs> but an immigration officer told me it was one of the most peaceful countries in the world. That was good enough for me, because I was sick and tired of looking over my shoulder. I arrived in Atero on 15th of May 2008. From the moment I landed at Auckland Airport, I felt the Manakitanga and Aroha that this country is known for. After six weeks in Mangra, I moved to Wellington to start a new life. My early life in New Zealand wasn't easy. I got a job as a security guard, but I left it I was, after I was attacked and beaten in the middle of night. I did a farm work, fruit picking, and started cleaning. My low wages meant I couldn't save to study, and in order to support my family back home, I picked up more and more hours until I was doing 80 hours a week. Ten years ago, Mr. Speaker, I was cleaning at the Teherengawaka, Victoria University of Wellington. I worked with some of the hardest people I know. Some of them are here today, Rebecca, Awak, and Ima. All I did was clean, 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 day and night. I didn't have a life. I didn't meet people. I wasn't active in the community. I didn't have a time to think or even dream. Then one day in 2013, my union organizer asked me to speak at the forum at Victoria University to challenge the mayoral candidates to make a commitment to pay a living wage. It was the first time I, I had ever spoken in public, and I was speaking on behalf of about 100 cleaners. I was scared, and I wanted to turn away I, when I saw the hub was packed. But the response to my speech changed something inside me. Before I spoke, I threw away the speech that I had prepared before and spoke from my heart. I said to the students, I see you each night studying and working away at your degrees and masters and PhDs. I told them that my dream was not to end up as a cleaner working 80 plus hours a week. My dream was to study, but I am stuck in the trap, the trap that's the poverty. 
I got active in the union, in the living wage movement, and in my refugee background community, and the Labour Party. I got a pay rise, and I decided to go to university. A few months later, one Sunday night, I was cleaning a lecture theatre. The next day, I had my first lecture, Politics 111, in that same lecture theatre. It was a very emotional moment that I will never forget. Mr. Speaker, my life has been transformed so quickly. In 12 years after moving to New Zealand, and five years after being a cleaner, four years after graduating, I became a member of this parliament. This is the result of overwhelming support that I have received. It is because of the people that I have met along the way. I'm very proud of my refugee background community and Changemakers Resettlement Forum and other advocacy groups across the country. I have always wanted to help my community and that's why I got involved in Changemakers and firstly as a member and then as the chair of the organization. On March 15, Mr. Speaker, our country suffered a tragic terrorist attack. It was like a bad dream. You never know, you, you never think this could happen in New Zealand. How could this happen to us? I was worried that it was the end of safe and peaceful New Zealand the immigration officer told me about. Then I saw the leadership of our prime minister and the massive support of New Zealanders. The mosques were not just guarded with flowers and loving messages, but the whole country came out and wrapped themselves around us, figuratively and literally. I couldn't control my emotions. The terrorists did not just want to attack and the mosque and take away few lives. He wanted to turn us against each other, but things did not go the way that he wanted. Thanks to our Prime Minister's leadership and to five million Kiwis who reacted with Aroha and embraced the Muslim community. Our bonds grew together, grew together. To me, it reinforced my identity and love that I have for New Zealand. Mr. Speaker, I will use my platform in Parliament to support and rebuild our community, champion the voice of refugees, refugee background New Zealanders, and stamp out racism in Aotearoa. One thing I really admire about New Zealand politics, and which restored my hope to be a politician, was when my friend told me that although politicians may debate in this chamber, then they will go afterwards and share a coffee and meal together. I will treat everyone, all my colleagues here in this house, with respect and dignity. I'm proud of my union, Living Wage Fund. I've been an E2 member, a delegate, an organizer. I've been a leader in the Living Wage Movement. I, saw, I was so proud a few months ago when E2 members who are MSD, MSD security guards won the Living Wage. When I recruited them I told to, jo to join the union, I told them that we will win the living wage if we all stand up together. After we won and rang, rang up all of them and told them, this is what it means to be in the union. This is what it means to be active in the living wage movement. This did not come from nothing. It's our victory. And now I'm here to be voice for workers, like those security guards and like my co-workers from uni. Mr. Speaker, while my life has dramatically transformed People like Rebecca Awak and Ima are still in the lowest page wages. They work hard, they work very long hours, and yet they still struggle to provide free meals for their kids. And 10 years of working hard, they're still poor. It should not be like that. Mr. Speaker, my vision is for all workers to lead a decent lives and participate in society with dignity and respect. My voice will be for every New Zealander who is struggling on low wages, whether they were born here or they were recently arrived. I will still stand up for every New Zealander who needs an opportunity, every New Zealander who needs a pay, decent pay and conditions, every New Zealander who needs equality and the chance to live in a fair country where everyone can thrive and live with dignity. Throughout my experience as a low-paid worker, I realized that the strong labor movement is essential to protecting the rights of vulnerable people. Strong labor movement is what's needed to create a just and fair society. 
Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to be part of the Labour Party because it's the party that shares my value of fairness in the community and the equal opportunities. I stand here because of the support the Labour, Par Labour Party Fund have given me and an opportunity to be a voice for those who often struggle their voices here. Thank you to our Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Jacinda Ardern and the Right the Honourable Grant Robertson for your leadership and also to much personal support to me. I'm here today because of the inspiration and support of many, many people, too many to name. Everyone I have met along the way has made an impact in my life and reached it. Thank you. This includes the people from my early life in Eritrea, to my family who passed on to me the values of social justice from a very young age. I send my love from afar. To everyone who helped me to get through early my days in Sudan, my cellmates in Cobra, the UNSCR, the people I nervously shared the plane to New Zealand with, and the friends I made in Mangri, Namihi Nui Kyakoto. To my New Zealand mom, Lindy McIntyre. <laughs> Thank you for everything. To my A2 and Living Wage Fund, especially Annie Neiman. Thank you for believing on me. Thank you for, to, to the workers who have risked a lot by standing up and trusting me to be your organizer. Paul Tolich, who chased me around Wellington with a Labour Party nomination from <laughs> Forum on the day it was due. I can't thank you enough. Thank you. And thank you to Flair for Simons who planted the possibility of me becoming an MP in my mind just about a year ago. Thank you. To Rory, Isabella, Gordon, and Winnie, because of your love and support, I never felt I'm away from my family. Thank you. To my friends and also who became my campaign team, Rory, Isabella, Nick Davis, Sam Graven, Steph Greger, and the many, many others, thank you for making me a better person. Mr. Speaker, to my caucus, I'm proud to be with a group that looks like much like New Zealand. And I'm excited about the next three years. Kia ora. Mr. Speaker, I end up with the final acknowledgement to all millions of people displaced around the world. Your courage in the face of unimaginable adversity will always inspire me. The reality is many millions of people will not have the luck that I have had. Until the world changes, innocent lives will continue to be lost and displaced in the hands of evil and war. That is what we must change. That is what we must change, Mr. Speaker. In my mother tongue, which is called Saho, I just wanted to say to these people, Sin Abliukani, which is I see you. Sin Arar Abliukani, which is I feel you. Insha'Allah, Prele Sinakani, which I will be on your side and fight alongside you. Norera Tena Koto. Tena koto, tena tato katoa.
oder The question is that a respectful address be presented to Her Excellency the Governor-General in reply to her speech. I move. Mr Speaker. Um, I'm not certain that there can be a point of order at this stage. The member has a very few seconds to convince me that there could be one. The call is very clearly that of the Honourable Judith Collins. Kei te motini te Pāti Māori ki a riro i a mātou, te kaumāri mā miniti, ki ngā kai arahi o te Pāti Māori i roto i tēnei wahanga whakau te kōra. Order. Order. The Honourable Judith Collins. Mr Speaker, I move that the following words be added to the address. 